So I want to thank Shanetta Michelle Green and Audrey Henderson for coming on to Real Talk with me today to have a discussion around race and the racism issue. And it's an uncomfortable conversation. And so I thank you guys for coming on to have this conversation. And I know Audrey and I've talked a little bit about it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I'm looking at it as an opportunity for us to come together as women who know each other's heart and to create more understanding and compassion and, and love around something that is a, it's a horrible situation, you know? And I know that I was watching on Netflix, Brene Brown, and she said, you know, we all have our bias. We all have our bias. And it's like each of our responsibility to look at how deep it runs, what they are, how many we have. And, you know, and I know with this, it, it's very true and it's very real. And it doesn't matter what community you live in, there's opportunities for, for us to each look. And what I want to do is I want to hear your experience. I've seen so much on, you know, social media and, and different places. And it, it's different when you're talking to somebody that you really know. So I want to start with asking you guys, why, why is it important for you to be here and to be having this conversation? Shanetta, you want to start first? Um, sure. It's important to me to be here for this conversation, number one, because you all asked me to. Um, I'm a firm believer that because I know both of your hearts, where Jesus Christ resides, that if he called us to it, there's a reason for that. And I truly believe that communication is, you know, part of the healing process. And I believe that as we communicate, it may open the doors for other people to feel safe and communicate with one another. Thank you. And thank you for, for being here. Audrey? I think for me, it's, um, it's important for me because I'm frustrated. Uh, and, and I see it um, both from the natural side and more from the spiritual side. I'm just frustrated at the way the enemy uses us, manipulates us, and, and has been using and manipulating us from the beginning of time. Um, and racism is just, it's, it's at the center core of it. Um, racism, I, I mean, it's just one of those things that whichever way the wind blows and then the media takes it and just spins it you know, all out of proportion. And, and I think we're just, we're all uneducated to some things. We're all confused about some things. Um, and, I, and I think we're, we're holding on to past issues on both sides. And um, I just think there's a conversation, the conversation needs to be had on racism everywhere. It first starts in the home. You change things at home, um, bit by bit. And then you change your communities and so on to the world or whatever. But it's a conversation that needs to be had by both sides. And I just felt important that um, it was here that I'd be here today, you know, just to share some of my experiences, you know, just so maybe somebody can see it from a different point of view, because until you experience what someone else has, you cannot understand what someone else is going through. And I believe that goes both ways. So that's why it was important for me to be here today. Yes. Thank you for being here. And yeah, I think that what you say is, is so true. There's, and there's so many perspectives and so many different beliefs and so many different narratives that are out there. And where I want us to come from right now is our experiences and what we've been through and, and what you guys have been through. And I know I, I'm ignorant to a lot of things. And even when this started, and Audrey, you were the first person that I thought of when I thought about reaching out to have this conversation. And, and there was a part in my mind, I'll be honest, that thought, I wonder if, if how much racism Audrey really experiences, you know? And we've talked some since then, and it, it's, it's, it's eye-opening for me. And, and that's, that's what I need. I need to, to hear that and see that. And I think that, like you said, we that's where it starts is us just having a conversation and sharing you know experiences so will you share some of your experience and and how 
racism has impacted your life and your family's life? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I haven't forgotten my first experience. And my first experience, um, I'm smiling now, but, you know, because it was when I was a kid. And so, you know, like the, you hear people say all the time, racism is taught. You know, it's not something we're born with. It's something we're taught. And so I think the first experience for me would have probably been in middle school. I remember my mom and my stepfather were um, going through a divorce. So, of course, we were losing a, an income in our house. So, um, you know, my mom had to make tough decisions because she was becoming a single parent. So we ended up having to move in what people call projects. And so we went from, my sister and I went from a two-parent household, two, two jobs, you know, mom and a dad, just like everybody else. So living in the projects was, you know, it was a little bit different, but, you know, we made it. But the, the experience I, I'm, I'm referring to was being in school and listening to a kid, you know, who happened to be white, a white kid. And um, there was a group of us. And so he was sitting there and he was talking to the group of us. And he was saying that his grandfather told him that all black people that lived in the projects were lazy and poor and dirty. And of course, I knew I lived in the project. I didn't know if he knew I lived in the project. But, you know, at that time, I was I was embarrassed. I was like, you know, you know, I don't even think I responded. <laughs> um, I just I was caught off guard. And, you know, it was something that was new for me because this group of kids I thought were my friends. And and they all, you know, went around, you know, the little circle. And, you know, they commented. Even with me standing there, they all went around the little circle. And, you know, everybody made their comment or whatever about, you know, what they thought or what their parents had said or whatever. And so I kind of just, you know, just kind of backed off and just faded away. And I remember going home that day and, you know, telling my mom what had happened or whatever. And, you know, this was a lady who was working probably two jobs at the time. And just, you know, whatever it took to make sure me and my sister had, she did. So, you know, just saying that to her and then watching her facial expression, you know, the frustration and, and confusion or whatever. And so for me, I took from that, it was like, and I think I even inboxed one of my close white friends about two weeks ago. And I said this to her, I said, please tell me why, because I don't understand this. And I said, I'm coming from a place of love. So I, I don't want you to be offended and I'm trying not to offend you, but please tell me why whenever... I don't know why. Why do white people assume that all black people are lazy and poor? Because I've worked my whole life, sometimes two jobs, you know, at a time. And so, you know, she she explained it to me from her perspective. And, you know, and then she also has to shed some light to me. Audrey, that's not how all white people look at you. And then I had to apologize because I thought about my question. When I referred the question to her, I did say all white people. And so it's it's just... Again, saying that conversations like that need to happen, like what we're doing now, explaining, you know, I had this experience and this is what happened and this is what made me feel this way. And so then from that experience, you go to having another bad experience with, say, when you come into contact with another white person. I believe me and you had this conversation the other day, Jennifer, and I told you sometimes because I've had so many experiences, I have to be careful and I have to check myself and make sure before I interact with someone else of a different race, I'm not taking that baggage into that next conversation or next interaction that I'm having. And I think that's what is happening. I know that's what's happening in a lot of instances. People are taking the interactions they have with others and they're going to the next relationship and I'm already on guard, you know, because I'm just assuming that's how you're gonna act with me. So I'm just already ready, I'm just, you know, um, I'm like a, a ticking time bomb. I'm just ready to, you know, take that experience or interaction and I'm ready to pop off at this person because I know that's where you're coming, you know, or that's where you're going. Yeah. And so we just, I just think we just got to check ourselves sometime because everybody's, especially now, everyone is frustrated or mad, you know, because of past things and because of things that are going on right now. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's, you know, a hundred years ago because you know, I, I shared this with you. I at least once a week, if not more, I deal with racism on some form. And I told you it's up to the person you choose. You kind of have to choose. I choose whether I'm going to let that situation or that instance, you know, dictate my day. 
you know, if I get called the M word that day by somebody, you know, on the road or uh, if somebody feels like I passed them or cut them off or, mm -hmm. or whatever, that word gets used a lot. And so I have to choose if I'm going to be mad for the rest of the day or, you know, if somebody makes a little joke at, you know, the water cooler, say at work or whatever. And, you know, I either walk off or, you know, just ignore it. You, you just, you, you choose. You, and, and it's sad that it's like that, but the reality is it's like that. And it's not just like that with one race. I'm sure it's like that with other races as well. But from my experience, I choose at least once or twice a week whether I'm going to react or whether I'm just going to ignore it and act like I don't see it. And as far as the experiences for my family, I think I shared this with somebody the other day. You know, I love my county. It's, it's a small county. We pretty much all know, you know, who's who. I mean, even down to names and whose mom is, I mean, because we've lived here all our lives. Mm -hmm. But when we go outside of the county, that's a whole other ball game. That's a whole different ball game. So anytime we go on vacation, vacation is what you're meant, you're winding down, you know, you're having fun or whatever. Vacation for me, from the time we leave our city limits to the time we get back to our city limits is nerve wracking. It's me, you know, making sure my husband is in the passenger seat, you know, me trying to drive or one of my daughters trying to drive because we're in fear of if we get stopped, you know, which way it may go. Sometimes we get stopped and it goes absolutely, you know, like it's supposed to go. Um, other times you meet somebody that he may have had a he or she may have had a bad day, you know, before they stopped us. So you get, you know, some conversation that you probably, you know, um, some conversation that you probably wouldn't get. You know, it happens. And um, I know sometimes it's easier for people to just ignore it and act like it doesn't happen. And I've seen a couple of times this week where if you um, are good or you don't break the law, you won't have those interactions with police. Listen, I've, I've been in law enforcement in some form of fashion my entire life. Um, but I've got to honestly say that's not 100 percent true. Mm -hmm. It's not 100 true. I would like for it to be 100 percent true, but it's not. And that's another sad thing. But I just think the experiences that we have, it kind of shapes and molds you and, and you almost become numb to the situation. And I think I even shared this with you. I'm embarrassed to say that even as a black woman before um, the George Floyd um, situation and, and, and the other ones, I really didn't pay as much of attention to people on the side of the road with say seven or eight police cars and one black man or whatever until the experience kind of hits you personally is when you kind of, Oh, well, you know, let me slow down a little bit, you know, to make sure that person's okay or whatever. Um, it's just a conversation that needs to be had. I think by everyone mm -hmm. and, and it starts in the home. I'm so glad you're doing this today. You know, trying to shed a little bit of light on it. And like I told you before, I I expect a little bit of backlash from from both sides because racism is it's uncomfortable. It just really is uncomfortable. You feel like no matter what you say, um, you're gonna offend somebody. And so I think that's why so many times, instead of us having a conversation, we choose to ignore it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And <clears throat> It, it's like you said, until it comes to the surface, it's not something that I'm thinking about a lot. But when, when, when something like this happens, it, it, it calls us to, to look at something in a different way and to look at racism in a different way. And so thank you for sharing your experience. And, and I'll be honest, hearing what you go through and that you experience this, you know, weekly, you experience something and this is my own ignorance is 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 surprising to me because because I, I i don't understand it you know and so that that's something i think that that we need to know we as white people need to know that you know that it it does it happens it happens more than we think it does so thank you audrey thank you for sharing that
Okay. Um, I think my experience has been a little bit different. I didn't grow up um, in Lake Butler. I actually grew up in Gainesville. And um, I was thinking about the question when you first asked it, Jennifer, because I think the question was, what was your personal experience with it? And I literally had to stop and just think for a second. And I think it goes back and I'll share a little bit about my history. I was raised by my parents, but my parents divorced when I was three. And so I spent a lot of my quality time with my grandparents on the weekend. And my grandfather, he was born in 1909. But that says a lot in read to his experiences and, and how he taught his children, him and my grandmother and grandchildren. So my first experience actually goes back to the first time Roots was actually aired on television. And I'm telling my age here, but um, I remember it was like a big family event where I was allowed to even stay up to watch Roots because I had to be maybe four or five, but I have a memory of it just like it was yesterday. And so I can remember conversations hearing my grandparents talk about racism, but of course, at that age, I had never experienced it. So as Roots was being aired, you know, best to the little comprehension, my little four or five year old mind could receive it. It taught me that there was a difference. Um, because prior to that, I attended an all African American church. I attended a daycare center that was primarily African American. My parent, my mother lived in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood, but my grandparents lived in a predominantly African American neighborhood. Mm -hmm. so a long time for me, my entire world was African American culture. I wasn't really exposed to Caucasian culture or, you know, our melting pot culture until I started um, school. And prior to that, I was just always taught that you can. Whatever you do in life, you can. I remember getting popped one time. You know, it wasn't a beating, but it was more of a spanking because I said I could do something. My mother had asked me to do something, and I kept saying, I can't, I can't. And I remember her saying to me, there's no such thing as I can't. And so I was always taught no matter what, no matter who it is, you are someone and you will do whatever it is. So even when I started school, that was my mindset. And I just remember always trying to be that overachiever. But this is where the racism comes in at. Um, I attended predominantly white schools at the time. And so you knew that there was a difference. It was more of the unsaid attitudes that occurred um, whenever myself or another African-American child would attempt to succeed at something or volunteer for something. Sometimes you felt kind of passed along and you didn't quite know why until you start putting things together or you referred back to some conversations that you overheard. In addition to that, I will never forget a particular time. My grandfather, after he retired from the University of Florida, he owned a landscaping business. And so I used to love to go with him to some of his clients' home. And he did a lot of um, landscaping for professors and doctors who worked at the University of Florida. And so they always treated us with the utmost respect until certain conversations were were um, had and I would overhear him always referring to them as yes ma'am yes sir here he was in his 70s and they may have been in their 30s or 40s and I remember having a conversation with him I probably was like eight or nine years old um, papas why do you refer to them as yes ma'am or yes sir and you're old enough to be their father or grandfather and so he had that conversation with me to educate me on just our southern culture because I just always assumed that only kids had to say yes ma'am or yes sir to their elders and so he had to educate me on that but my own true personal outward experience with racism was I was in high school and um, one of my very good friends for the first time she had invited me to um, come over to her home and so we were both into modeling at the time and I remember um, coming to her home after we went to a, a modeling practice and 
I get to her home and her mother came home a little bit after we arrived because we walked, we were in walking distance of where we were. And so we're there and, you know, like most kids after school, you clean up and then you have a snack. So that's what we were doing. And um, so her mother was talking with her because she was in another room of the house and I was in their kitchen. And so her, she told her that I was there visiting. And for whatever reason, she had talked about me prior, but her mother had never met me. And so when her mother walks into the kitchen, it went from a smile to a frown. And so I introduced myself like I would with any parent at that time. And we had, you know, short conversation, but her mother asked her if she could speak with her. And so they went into another room. And so my friend came back and she had tears in her eyes. And um, I talked to her for a little bit. So within about five or 10 minutes, she she asked me, did I mind going home? That was the best way she could put it. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, did I do something wrong? And so she was like, no, my mother, you know, wants me to do some things around the house. And that was her excuse or whatever. So I left, but we had the conversation the next day and she told me the truth. Her mother didn't know that I was African American. And so it opened up some conversation between she and I, because I was the only true friend that she felt she had and her parents had told her she couldn't be my friend anymore and so it put me between a rock and a hard place because i really liked my friend but at the same time the attitude of i'm good enough to be you know your friend but not to your parents based on the color of my skin and prior to them meeting me they thought i was because they always encouraged her concerning our friendship. So that was my first personal, I believe I was in ninth or 10th grade, you know, when that happened. But for me, it reinforced the belief that no matter what I can and I am someone. And I think that is what carried me, you know, throughout um, high school and then in college. But going back to, um, well, coming to the present, how it has affected me, I would say, is even in corporate America, and it goes back again to attitudes, Jennifer and Audrey. As Audrey mentioned earlier, you know, you walk in a room sometimes. And in the workplace, often I have been the only one, only African American. And in my mind, there's always that assumption that I'm less than because I'm African American. And that assumption that that's how my counterparts think of me or feel. And I've had to always deal with myself concerning that and just to remember to be who I am because regardless of the color of my skin, I'm a human being at the end of the day. And so that is something that has, you know, always affected me. And I've always wondered, I'm, again, I'm glad we're having this conversation because it's always been one of the questions that I've had for my counterparts is because of the color of my skin, do you see me as less than? Because I'm proud of the color of my skin, just like I hope you're proud of the color of your skin. But do you see me as less than? You know, that's always been one of the questions. And then I would say, too, because I have an African-American son, of course, um, in present day, it really causes me to ask him more questions pertaining to his safety. Um, he travels. He's a truck driver, so he's on the road all the time. And so um, even when he's in certain parts of the country, you know, that we know it's very outward in read to racism, you know, I'll ask him questions pertaining to that. So that's where I am presently with that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. And yeah, so one of the questions that, that came up when Audrey was speaking, and it also came up with you, and you touched on it a little bit, but how does it impact you and, and, the, the story you tell yourself about who you are and your, your worth and your place in this world and with your son, you know, Audrey, with your husband, you know, you, with your family members, what, what is the impact that those, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm also hearing too that it, we tend to then make a lot of generalizations mm -hmm. and so it's weeding through those generalizations, but you know, as a, as a child, as a, as a ninth grader, you know, Audrey, as a, as, a, as a little kid, like, what does that tell you about who you are and your own worth when, when these things happen? 
honestly, it's a hard, it's, the impact is hard. It, it, it almost makes you feel, as a kid, you feel worthless. Um, you feel like you don't measure up. And um, you have questions like, why? You know, what, or what did I do? Or, you know, why does this person not like me? And as a kid, you don't really understand, you know, what's going on. I heard Shanetta say about the incident she had as a teenager. I had that same incident, but probably as a sixth grader. Um, I remember going home with, you know, someone, we, we've been friends almost the entire school year. And, you know, her asking me to come over and just being excited about going, you know, to all girls, what was going to be a slumber party, but I didn't even make the slumber party once um, I, I got there. Um, and, and it was tough for my mom to even agree to say yes, because um, I think in the back of her head, she already felt like, you know, what happened was going to happen. Um, and so going there as a kid, as a sixth grader and coming in the living room and hearing what was my friend's older brother say, why did you bring that nigger home? And, you know, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't even know how to react. I mean, I know her, her house was in walking distance from mine, so of course I left immediately, but you know, you know, my friend, she cried, her and her brother had a, a big argument, and you know, she cried, and she was upset, and begged me not to leave, but you know, after that, you just, you're, and I mean, how do you stay after that? You're uncomfortable, and just as a kid, you, you know, you just feel worthless, you know, I remember going home, telling my mom, her getting upset, and you know, me just going to my room and crying, because I'm like, you know, why... The question you have is, why do some white people hate us? Why? I mean, yeah. you know, and, and just, <laughs> I'm almost, what, 45 now, and still I can't even answer that question. At some point, I just stopped trying to answer that question. But as a kid, that's, you know, that's rough on a kid. And then a parent trying to explain to a kid, you know, I mean, my mom, she had no words for that. She couldn't explain why somebody else felt the way they felt. And so it's hard. And you, growing up, you hear a lot of different conversations, especially from the, the older generation who, like my grandmother, who actually lived, you know, back. So you hear all of that stuff um, growing up. And so like it just, it, it kind of jades you a little bit. You know, it's hard trying, like I say, I say this a lot, you have to choose you just have to keep choosing to love instead of hate because the experiences, just the experiences alone, and so many of them will just darn near take you out because you're just, you're confused, you're, you're hurt, you're mad, you're angry. And then when you see someone or you hear someone that tries to minimize it by saying that, oh, that was 100 years ago, or why are you still complaining, or why do y'all whine about this stuff? Because it's not a hundred years ago because it's still present day form right now. And so, yeah, for me, I just, I, like I told you before, I just have to choose every day of how I'm going to move on with the next day. Cause I mean, living in Lake Butler and I'm not going to say racism and not, is not in Lake Butler. Cause I would be lying if I say it wasn't what I sometimes say is when you leave outside of Lake Butler, you kind of leave outside of your bubble. Um, because we're in a little bubble here, you know. I think we have our racism in a little bubble, and we're comfortable with it. If we don't talk about it with each other, we just act like we don't see it, and we just go on about our busy day. And then we only have to deal with it at voting time, because that's usually when it comes up, when all of the stuff gets heated up and it starts from Republicans to Democrat, and then somehow it leaps over into racism, black and white. Uh, the impact is. I mean, it's rough. It, I'm going to be honest with you. It, it really is rough. And you just have to choose from day to day which way you're going to move. And the conversations, I've had conversations with, you know, my daughters on things where I tell them you have to do 110%. You can't just give 100%. You have to give 110% because that was a conversation I got from my mom. And that was a conversation she had from her mom and so on and so on. We can't do the bare minimum we have to do over and beyond and it's sad that we can't just be equal why can't we all just give 100 percent why do i have to give 110 percent and the next person has to give 100 percent and it's and i mentioned this to you to, the other day that is i've dealt with it for so long that it's almost become like 
secondary nature. Like it's, it's a part of who I am. It's like I have to move a certain way to get a certain result. And then even sometimes moving a certain way doesn't give me the result that I want. And so for me, I can't speak for Shanetta, but for me, the impact sometimes is, is devastating. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, I'm hearing it. It, it. it runs deep and it hits deep, deep into the core of who you are. And it forces you to live your life trying to prove prove yourself and prove your worth instead of it just I feel like I have to just keep doing more. I have to, um, you know, I, I have to live a certain way. I have to not get in trouble. My whole life since, since a kid has been about not getting in trouble. As a kid, it was, okay, be a good girl. And then people might like you. Um, yeah. Be a good person and then people will accept you. Um, you know, just be a good family and then you'll be okay. And it's sad. You should not have to live like that. I mean, I want to be a good person because I'm a Christian and that's just who I am. I want to live the way that Jesus says I should live, not because of the way a man or a woman thinks that's the way I should live or that's the car that I should drive or that's the house that I should live in or that's the neighborhood that I should live in. Because, I mean, let's be honest, we don't see it so much here, but in the bigger cities, you're you can't even live in certain neighborhoods or now you can't even drive in certain neighborhoods or yeah. run in certain neighborhoods. And uh, it's just, it's crazy. It, it, you know, yeah. and I just think we have to start where we are right now, you know, so people can understand each other and just, you know, we say it all the time. There's good and bad in every race. If that's, if, if we could all get there, accepting there's good and bad in every race not just looking at a whole race of people and counting them out because you know that's what my great 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 grandpa said about them or whatever if i take the time and sit down and we get to know each other and we might just find out that we have way more in common than we think we have yeah, yeah. and that's, that's just where i am yeah, yeah, and I think that's true, and that's why I'm sitting here having this conversation. God's brought many different people, different religions, different races, different um, sexual orientations, different, just different, and when you get to know somebody, it forces you to look at those differences in a different way, and for me, it's been learning to to appreciate those differences. So I, I hear that, and I hear that it's it's forced you to kind of have to to live this. What you see is trying to be a perfect life, so that people will receive you and see who you are. But in reality, none of us are perfect, and so in those moments where where you slip up, it. It, 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 it hits you harder because you're trying to maintain the standard so you can be an example and not be, be lumped in that box that, Absolutely. that, that people want to put us in. Absolutely. Yeah. That, I, that, I, that I probably get put in anyways. <laughs> um, and, and that's the funny part of it. Sometimes you think about, um, you know, no matter what I do, um, no matter how safe I try to be um, to some people, you know, I'm just black, you yeah. know, and don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm proud of being black. I love my race, but to some people being black is looked at as negative as bad. And, you know, and so, and like I say, when I leave outside of my bubble, um, in my town, I would like to think I'm Audrey Henderson, but once I leave outside of my town, I'm just another black woman. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and so it, it, it was funny just today. Um, my husband and I were going to the store and so I got out to go to the store and I, you know, I, I these type of things, I, this, I try not to pay attention to them so much. The purse clutching, you know, when someone sees me and they clutch their purse closer to them. Or for instance, um, I had an, I went to the library one day and this one, uh, this one was it was hilarious afterwards. It wasn't so hilarious at the time, but I'm sitting in the library and I'm reading a magazine and I hear the lady talking to one of the attendants at the library and she tells her that she needs to watch me because I'm going to steal something. Mm. And so I'm like, wait a minute. 
you know, I don't, I didn't just hear that. This, this is 2019. There's no way I just heard that. And so I heard the lady ask her, she said, ma'am, she was trying to be real respectful because she was an older lady. And she said, ma'am, she said, I'm sorry, what'd you say? She said, you need to watch the black lady because she's going to steal something. And at that point, I know she's talking about me. I'm the only black lady in the library. And, and so at that moment was one of those moments where, again, I had to choose whether I was going to be hateful or whether I was going to ignore it or whether I was going to make a comment. And so that day I did make a comment and I said, ma'am, I promise you there's nothing in the library that I want to steal. I think it's all free anyways, but if I wanted to get something out of the library, I just go ahead and buy it. And I got my stuff and I looked at the attendant and I laughed and I just left, the, you know, and then I came back later and the attendant, she apologized and she said, you know, Ms. Henderson, don't worry about that. And there was no need for her to apologize. You shouldn't have to apologize for the way that somebody else feels. Mm. You know, the, those, those things happen all the time. And like I said, I told you at least once or, once or twice a week. So I've already met my once a week today with the, the purse clutching and, you know, kind of looking back over the shoulder to see if I was going to take a purse or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, that type of stuff. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it, that's shocking to me, honestly. I, and I don't know why, but that's something I, I need to look at. Why that? Why that shocking to me? Well, believe it or not, sometimes it's shocking to me. Even though it happens to me, sometimes I think um, being in this bubble will 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 make you forget sometimes, and then it just it slaps you right back in the face and wakes you right back up again. Yeah, um, really hits you, and and you know you just come right back to where we are. Yeah. Well, and you know, and, and I'll be honest, it, it is different when, when you leave like Butler, your experience is different. And, and my, my experience, you know, I, I don't know as so much like in Gainesville or somewhere, but traveling to bigger cities, that's when I see ingrained stuff like, I don't carry a purse, so not clutching my purse, but I did notice this. And, and I believe it was a black man that I was sitting in my car and I was in a city that I didn't know, didn't really know what area I was in. And not that that matters, but I mean, I think some degree, it, you know, if I'm in a really dangerous area, then yes, but I think I would probably be able to know that. But there was a man walking towards me and towards my car. And my instinct was to go to lock the door. And I'm at a place where I, I, I try to look like, is this reaction or is this something that's real, you know? And my first thought was, wait, what am I doing? And then I thought, if he sees me reach up to lock the door, how will that make him feel? Mm -hmm. And if it was me, how would it make me feel? And... I, and, and that changed my perspective on the whole thing, you know, and, and it is, I think a lot of it is that ingrained stuff and the stuff we grew up in, whatever community we grew up in, the stuff on the media, that, and, and, and the shows and different things, that forms so much of our beliefs and if we're not willing to question whether our beliefs match up to that still small voice within then we're not taking responsibility because what we believe is our responsibility everything that we're fed we shouldn't take on as beliefs um, yes. and it sounds like that's something that that is universal that you have to, to look at the ingrained stuff also, just like I, ha we all have to. Does that seem? Does that seem right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You want to speak to that? I do. Um, wow, that was powerful. Very powerful. But I, I want to. You know, you ask and Rita how it impacts, and I'll go back. You know, to ninth grade. It caused me honestly to want to even be better than to prove her mom wrong. Mm -hmm. You. Know? because it wasn't just her mom, but just our society in general. At my high school, and I, I graduated from Buholtz, we had an African-American club called Jamal. Mm -hmm. 
And it taught a lot about African history, the, co the continent of Africa in general. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just African-American kids that were invited the entire school population, you know, was invited. And so it wasn't just African-American students in the club. There were other races in the club. And so I grew up, though, with a mother and a great aunt who um, taught me a lot about African-American history in addition to the, the history of the different countries in Africa. And so when I experienced it, even at a young age, it caused me to want to even prove them wrong you know prove them wrong and so I look back and and read to how it impacted me the most I think it caused me to become angry in addition to prideful almost you know and I had to watch myself not to cross that line of um, developing some hatred almost because of that. And so I, I desire to educate myself even more so. But another impact it had on me was it caused me to want to isolate almost away from other cultures and stay within my safe zone. You know, again, I attended a predominantly African American church and my grandparents lived in a predominantly African American neighborhood. So it caused me to want to shut the outside world out almost the only time i had to deal with those attitudes was at school and so um a lot of my family members had attended and graduated from hbcus historical black colleges and universities that originally began because we could not attend predominant you know um occasion universities or colleges and so that formed you know even more so my decision i think ninth grade I knew I was going to HBCU because I enjoy educating myself even more about who I you know my race was but in addition that safety zone almost I knew it's I don't have to always walk in a room feeling like I have I'm in a competition with someone or I have to prove myself to someone you know so it wasn't until I believe I probably was um an adult in my early 20s where I realized that I had began to develop some anger and hatred, you know, towards other um, races who were, you know, that I perceived were suppressing. So it taught me, though, to teach my son from a different angle, not only educate him, but expose him more, you know, to other cultures, because we lived in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood. So before I realized what was going on, I felt like I was protecting him too much from it. I didn't want him to have those experiences. So I was protecting him from it, but I began to realize a lot of his friends were Caucasian. And I had to accept responsibility of that because he went to a predominantly Caucasian school or he went, you know, where we live. So I had to deal with my own heart concerning that because I did not want him to grow up with some of the con um, conceived notions that I had based on my own experiences. I kind of opened up my heart some to that, but then he experienced it in pre-K. And I will never forget this because um, he used to talk about this little girl in his class. And so I knew he must have had a little crush on her or whatever. And so um, it just so happened my one of my cousins was one of his teachers in his class and so she told me one day, she's like yeah i thank dominique and i forgot the little girl's name they have a little crush on each other so you know we laughed about it or whatever didn't take it serious until it was their little graduation ceremony and um i will never forget her mom I guess she had never met dominique i had saw the little girl so i knew she was caucasian but um her mom, when the little girl introduced Dominique to her, her, I remember her mom grabbing her hand and kind of holding her hand and pulling her back a little bit. And I went over, because I'm watching this unfold, so I went over to introduce myself just to talk to the mom about how much Dominique and the little girl talk about each other. And the woman would not even establish eye contact with me. So that experience once again took me back to a place again rise above and beyond and 
if you're not careful, it can cause you to develop some anger and hatred towards that type of behavior. So um, how it continues, though, to impact me today, really coming from a place of love, because I believe that the way to um, for all of us to heal is through love. One of my first jobs after graduating from college was working for a department of children and families. And you're taught all of these stereotypes, as we know, growing up. And, and off, sometimes you end up believing some of these stereotypes. You know, Audrey, you were speaking of earlier, read to the projects, how, you know, people were taught that the only people lived in projects were poor people or people on welfare or whatever the case may be. And so here I was um, at that time, one of the only African-American um, child protective investigators back in the late 90s over in Alachua County. And so I walk in and as we're going through the training, you, you realize that most of the DCF cases did not involve African-American families. Believe it or not, at that time, they were of people of other races. And so it caused me to begin to look at my own heart because I had to go into a lot of the homes, you know, counterparts. And I'm a very loving and caring person, so I couldn't turn it on and turn it off. I had to be who I was with all races. And so it just helped me to understand that you can love any and everybody. And, you know, I always believed in treating the children that I serve like they're my own children, the families that I serve like they're my own families. And I think with that, it has caused a lot of people to not look at the color of my skin, not saying they don't see it because I know it's there. Um, one of the things that I still struggle with is when I hear people say, I don't see color. My first question to that is how can you not see color? And I ask a friend of mine, please explain to me when people say that because just part of human nature, you know, if you see a dog walk by, you look, you see a dog, you notice what type of dog it is and what type of hair it has. And if the dog is going to attack me or not, you notice that was well, the same thing with our outward appearance. We see that, but it's how do you respond to that? And it goes back to the heart issue, you know? So for me, you know, and reach a present day, it causes me to always look at where certain things are coming from, you know, and, and try to still treat people with love. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I, that that's true for me too. And and the experience is that it is about coming back to love and letting go of of conditioning and you know beliefs that that really don't serve us or that divide us or that for me that 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 can block my relationship with spirit. Because when we carry those things, that that's ultimately what it does. It ends up hurting other people, but it also hurts our relationship with spirit as well. And you you are both very godly women. And so, Audrey, do you want to speak to that a little bit? How, despite the frustration and the the anger and and what you experience, what how do you choose? to to continue to love and to continue to try to be understanding first and, and foremost i think i i remember or, or try to remember rehash some of the things that jesus went through and you know i know sometimes that's cliche and people are like oh you know people always say that or you know the things that jesus went through and so i try to you know say or or put it put it in retrospect like this Jesus endured so much for all of us, so much for all of us. So I, I look at the little stuff like the people, the lady clutching her purse or, you know, you know, the alarm going off when I walk by the car, or, you know, little stuff like I'm like, that stuff is so little, little, small compared to, you know, the stripes that Jesus bore for us. So I try to, and I don't want to say minimize it because Lord, I know somebody's going to be upset about me saying this, but, you know, I just try to, look. it's not that big. It is big, but it's not that big. It's not something that's going to kill me. 
you know, somebody setting their alarm off or the lady clutching a purse or, you know, the people getting up not wanting to sit beside us in a restaurant or asking the waiter to come back over and say, can we be moved or, you know, stuff like that that happens all the time. And I'm just like, I'm just going to choose to love in spite of, because I'm going to be real. Not only does racism happen, you know, between black and white people, it happens in our own race. That's, that's how bad and how deep racism is. Not only has it been ingrained in the minds of white people, it's been ingrained in the minds of black people, um, even with just the different shades of our skins. If one person is lighter or this person is darker, you know, and I know that's a whole nother conversation that needs to be had um, between the black community. But racism is so deep and so hurtful. And I, I just think about all the time, you know, what would Jesus do? Um, that's, that's, that's the only way I can make it. The only, my pastor's wife said one time, I would have lost my mind a long time ago had it not been for Jesus. I promise you that is what I live by. I would have lost my mind a long time ago if I have not had my own personal encounter relationship with Jesus. That is what teaches me to love. That, that's what motivates me to love. That's what keeps me loving is thinking about you know, what Jesus went through and, and how can I live my life and be more of a role model to someone else? How can I act, you know, like people to bend and not be racist? Or how can I ask black people to love and, and keep moving in spite of is other than be an example, you know, of just what would Jesus do? That's, that's the only, that's the only way that I can make it. Um, is with by the love of God. Yeah, it's to continuously focus on the spiritual relationship instead of focused and becoming part of of, of what the world. Wants. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because I could easily choose and go the other way and yeah. just be thankful and just whenever um, I'm faced with it, um, you know, just react the way that the world reacts or reacts the way that you know. Satan would or the enemy would like for me to act. I can easily do that. It's, it's a choice. And, and some days the choice is harder than, than the others because sometimes we're, you're faced with it and you're slapped right in the face and you don't really have time to think. And it's like, mm, boy, I could have said this or I could have did this or I could have, you know, whatever. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's the love of God. Yeah, giving yourself the space to feel what's real and what what these hurts calls you, and yet still not not reacting from that place, seeing mm -hmm. what it is, and still choosing to to, to act from a different place. And, and oh yeah, it, it wasn't always that way. It come it definitely came with growth for me because yeah. you know somewhere along that the teenager years, I was bitter. You know mm -hmm. just angry, you know, just hurt. And I wanted, if somebody said something to me or somebody called me the N word, I absolutely responded. You know, there's no need for me to sit here and lie and say, oh yeah, I've been perfect my whole entire life. And, you know, I've always used the love of God to, you know, get over. No, that's a lie. That's yeah. a lie for the pits of hell. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, and I appreciate you saying that because I think that for me, and again, you know, this, this may be my ignorant showing and, and I trust y'all to, to call me out on that, but it is, um, it's the same for me. Like I can see that, that my beliefs and my views and my heart has changed over time. And I think that's, that's a natural progress based on, you know, where we, where we were then and where we are now. Um, and Shanette, I don't know if you have anything you want to want to add to that, but if you have okay. something you want to say, then I, I would love to hear from you on that. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Well, and Audrey, when we were talk, when we were having a conversation before, kind of talking about this, you had shared about wanting, you know, people not pretending that they're somewhere else, and I'd shared that I think that sometimes we go from you know, something like what's going on right now to immediately going to, you know, I don't see color and I don't have, you know, I'm not a racist and I, I love everybody. 
but we have to, I think we have to stop and say, but what, what's there, what's really there and what thoughts are there. And, and what you had said that day was something about people being where they are and we are all where we are. And if we can't accept and look at where we are, then we can't create change. If I'm trying to pretend I'm, um, don't, don't have a racist thought in my mind and that's not what's reality, then I can't create change. We can only create change when we begin to. That seems to be true for, for it doesn't matter what race we are. But in this situation, how do you feel like, what is the best way to start moving forward or moving forward more? Because again, this may be my ignorance, but it seems like things are a little bit better than they used to be. And, and I'm looking at that in like terms of Lake Butler. But I mean, that, that would be if somebody asked me, is it the same as it was when you were in high school? I would say, no, it doesn't seem to be. Um, but again, that may be my ignorance. And I'm completely, you know, I, I know that. But are things progressing forward from your standpoint? Is it happening less? Or is it happening more? Or and and how do we continue to to move to move our hearts forward? I I think for me, I can't speak for everybody, so I would say it would solely depend on the person and their experiences. Um, because what may happen for me may not happen for someone else. Um, because my reaction to something may be totally different from someone else's reaction. So I can't say for the next, you know, black man or woman, because even I think I mentioned this to you the other day when I talked to you, even a black man and a black woman, we have two totally different experiences with racism. It's two totally different things. I, I can't, you know, understand or be in my husband's shoes and, and see what he goes through in, in a day and vice versa for him. It's, you know, we'll share it sometimes, you know, as all husband and wives do. So I think it totally depends on the person and what experiences they have had. I will say, I, for me, we've all grown up. We're grown now. We think more, we're more thoughtful of things that we say now as opposed to when we were kids and teenagers. And of course, you know, we all have the conversations at home in our houses, you know, with our parents. And when you're home, you're free. You're, it's, that's your free space, your free time. So conversations that you have at home are definitely not the conversations, um, you know, you have when you're with other people. So again, I can't, I can't speak for someone else. What I can say is, do I get called the N-word like I did when I was a teenager? No, I don't. Are my reactions different now than when I was a teenager? Absolutely. Um, but is is it still here? Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I'd, I'd be lying and I'd be doing us all just the injustice by saying that it, that it's still not alive, well, and breathing racism when I, when I say that. But, um, and, and I want to say this to what you just said, because you 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 say this a, a bit about you know being ignorant to the fact of whatever and and you said it seems like it's gotten better i think again that is because we live in and as hard as people want to say we don't we live in two different americas um it's there i mean one world but just two different yeah two different places and i hope you understand what i'm saying okay. when i say that we live in we live in a white world and we live in a black world. Even though there's other races here that we say it's a melting pot, but we're the two races that have the most history together. And so there are just two worlds and, and, and I think we move and we operate differently in those two worlds that we like to pretend that doesn't exist, but they do. Um, and so I, I'm, I mean, our, our, gosh, here we go where where it's a mouthful and it's kind of hard to say and you know get it out without you know mm. are are things are some things better yeah yeah you know i'm not gonna lie but are thing are some things still the same yeah absolutely so i i think that would be i think that would be my answer um 
I think I, I can use myself for an example. And, and I remember taking my grandmother up to, um, to my shop and we were sitting in the shop and my grandmother is, she says she's 82, but we think she's older than that. Um, that's, <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> you know, for, for those of you who don't know, you know, um, I had the shop, you know, up behind the jail. And so my grandmother was, I think she was a little bit shocked, you know, when I took her up there and I showed her, you know, my spot or whatever. And, she said, this is yours? And I said, well, Grandma, I rent it from somebody, but yeah, basically, it's my shop. She said, you're right up behind the jail? And I said, yeah. And she said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, Grandma. <laughs> and so, you know, her being 80-something years old, probably, you know, in her time, that would have never happened, yeah. you know. So are we changing in some areas? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, are... Is it's there still, still yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Janetta. Do you have something to add to that? Yes, I, I agree with um, everything that's been said, but my mind is more even so focused on how do we move forward. You know, that's something that I have really been focusing on me personally since all of this has um, been occurring and you know God keeps bringing me back and I know this is more for seasoned believers but he keeps bringing me back to our gifts you know because I've been asking him Lord what can I do different you know when we get back to school you know my my career is very important to me and just not only with my family or people in the community but the impact that we I have on the kids that I work with or the staff that I interact with, you know, and he keeps telling me to fall back on your gift, you know, and I know for me, my ministerial gift is teaching. And I'm a firm believer in educating people, you know, when things are said, question it, talk to them about it, and not in a negative way, but in love again. Because I think that when we don't, we're reinforcing even more so the belief systems or, um, you know, earlier when Audrey was talking, it reminded me of, you know, the saying, we take 10, 10 steps forward and then we take six or seven backwards. And when we don't talk about it or when we don't address things, in my mind, that's what's continuing to happen. So in my opinion, how we move forward is we, we have to address it. And I know for me personally, that's educating people. You know, when you first ask us and read to the question and read to how it impact us, one of the things I thought about just in our country alone the impact of slavery itself, and even not just slavery, but what occurred to the Native Americans and then, you know, indentured servanthood and then, you know, slavery, which came on. But my mind started thinking about that because I'm a history lover. So I start thinking about, you know, the history of racism in our country and prejudices and stereotypes. And as I was thinking about it, I was like, Lord, this stuff has literally just in our country alone, it's been going on for 400 years. It literally has and so I looked up when when was the first slaves brought here to um, America in 1619 that's 401 year ago you know here we are in 2020 but when you think of an impact of something it has so many layers we're going back 400 plus years so many layers and Audrey was talking about um, colorism earlier that alone i believe has affected me more as an african-american than racism itself but where did colorism come from it came from racism so it's a lot that we have to think about as we move forward but i think this is a great start having conversations and making sure that as things are coming up we're talking to people about them and then sometimes taking that extra step. Audrey mentioned earlier that we have to educate our kids within the home, you know, and I, I had posted something, Audrey, like that a couple, I think about two weeks ago, because that's the first thing my mind went to is what are we teaching the children of today? 
you know, um, Jennifer, you talk about even television. I thought about shows that even impacted my life growing up, the negative impacts and the positive impacts. Like my parents, my mother would not let me watch. Y'all remember the show, It Live in Color. She wouldn't let me watch it because it, it um, magnified some negative stereotypes, not only the African-American community, but just, co just society within itself. And I used to hate that my friends would talk about the show the next morning when we would come back to school, but I wasn't allowed to watch things like that. And I think my mother, you know, now when I look back, I thank her for a lot of the things that she did not let me be a part of because of things like that. But it reminds me of what are we educating our kids? And for today's generation, they receive more education from social media than anything. From our generation, it was television and music, you know? So for me personally, I know that that's how I want to move forward is making sure I'm continuing to educate people and have conversations like this because I think women like us have a lot to offer because we do have relationships with the Lord. You know, I've watched a lot of the commentary about this and it's so full of anger and rage and just a lot of unwanted emotions that I have often had to turn it off myself because I did not, you know, the Bible teaches us to be um, mindful of what we put in. And I did not want some of those old things that existed within me to be water once again, to bring up some of the anger or to bring up, you know, some of the prideful thoughts that I used to have. So I think as, you know, we talk about moving forward for us individually, individually, look at the gifts that God has given us. You know, um, Audrey, you do so much for not only the African-American community, but you know, just a, a, in um, a Lake Butler and, you know, a, above, um, you just do so much. You have such a heart of giving. Jennifer, I don't know you like that, but just from, you know, my interaction with you, I felt very comfortable around you when I first met you. And so, and just knowing what you're doing now with real talk, that's a gift that God has given you, you with me. Like I said, mine is teaching. So just using us three ladies as an example utilizing the gifts that God has given us and move forward. Let this be a focus for us, you know? Yeah. Continue, continue to use our gifts in ways that God, God is leading us to, to use those. Yeah. There's so much to this, to, to racism and there's so many tentacles to it and yes. it, it can almost feel overwhelming and like, what do I do or how can I help or where do we start? And so for me, you know, it's funny as we were talking about doing this, when I first talked to Audrey, it was about, you know, starting with our hearts and starting with what's true for us, just like what we're talking about right now. But over as after we set the date for, for us doing this and over the last like week and a half, I've been consuming, I've been watching and listening to and reading comments, everything that I can get my hands on in social media. Well, to, about, three days ago, I started feeling this pit in my stomach and I started feeling like, what, how, which direction are we going to go? And yesterday, you know, I, I, I committed myself to, to, to trying to clear my head out yesterday so that I could show up in the best possible way for, for this today. And what I realized is that while I was trying to, to understand and educate myself, I also wasn't being, selective enough with what I was letting into myself. And I don't, I don't, I don't have a TV in my living room. I don't watch the news because there's just so much, you know, bias and, and arguing and all of that. And I think that, that what you're saying is we have to take responsibility for the information that we're letting into our mind, the information that we're letting into our heart because it does impact us. And, and I know for me where, I, where, where those feelings were coming from was, I was the, the voices in my head and all of the thoughts and all of that was, was, was smothering that, the, that still small voice. Yes. And until we can start to, to kind of let go of some of that to really see, because I believe we all have a different way that we're supposed to show up around this also. And right. if we're not careful, we'll be trying to do it somebody else's way because, you know, they're talking louder than, than the other person. And so 
you know, I appreciate the fact that we were able to come together and to, to have this conversation. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been talking for, for a while and, and I feel like we could, we go on. No, I got like a lot more questions. So maybe this is something that we can do another one of these and, and, and keep the conversation going a little bit and continue to, to educate ourselves, continue to, to be able to, to hear each other. Because I think that uh, there's so much noise in this world that a lot of times we don't even get to hear each other. And um, so I, I appreciate you guys for being here. I want to ask you, Shanetta, you mentioned colorism. Can you mm-hmm. explain that to me? Because I've never heard that. And, and yes, I'm colorism that. is um, prejudices that are experienced within a particular culture okay. by other. Um, Audrey was mentioning earlier about, you know, the name calling. Um, One experience that I, that always impacted me as a very small child was, you know, hearing other African American call call each other such terms as blacky or smoky or darky, you know, things like that. But then again, that goes back to racism because of the names that we were called, such as coon or, you know, um, bamboozling and all of that type of stuff with the black face, you know. So, um, again, I was taught at a very early age, you don't say things like that because it can bring someone down. It can make them believe that they're less than. Um, there used to be a thing called the paper bag um, test. And Audrey, I know you know what I'm talking about, but our grandmothers, they experienced that my grandmother was biracial and so she was on one side of the paper bag where my grandfather was my complexion and he was on the other side of the paper bag and what that meant was if you were the complexion of a brown paper bag you were not accepted into certain social clubs within the african-american community um couldn't go certain places through the front door, you had to go through the back door, even within our own communities. And it still exists, you know, um, as you all know, I work for the school system. And so I never forget my first year coming back, I heard one of the African American kids call another kid um, Blackie. And it did something to me because here I'm thinking, you know, I'm 40 something years old. Are our kids still using terms like that? So it still definitely exists within our own community. But again, it stems from racism and the things that we were taught about each other. So, yeah. Well, you know, the I, I kept going back to the Maya Angelou, you know, when you know better, you do better. Yes. And, and I think that, <laughs> That's where I'm coming from with this. That's where I'm coming from with myself, you know, and, and I encourage anybody who's, who's listening to this, who's watching us to just ask yourself, you know, where can I do better? Where do I have more room in my heart for love? I mean, and it, like you said, with the phrases, yeah. is there some way that I can, can be different so that not in a way that it takes away from who we are, but Right. You know, if I say something, I, I can say to you guys, I may not know, and right. I want you to tell me. And and it's not because I feel like, oh, I need to, to do something to make, you know, you feel better. But it's about if I'm doing something that's hurting you, mm-hmm. then why would I want to do that? And it doesn't hurt me at all to say something different you know what I mean and so just to question ourselves to start with ourselves to start like we said the conversations with the people close to us and to step through the discomfort because it is uncomfortable but that is the only way that we're going to be able to to move forward and create healing and um, so I that that's kind of where where I am, and I don't know if you guys have any final thoughts that you want to say. And like I said, we can come back and talk about this more if y'all are up to it. Yes, I, I absolutely do want to come back and talk about it some more. I just want to give everybody that's watching just a little bit of um, homework until our next one. I want to say, you know, for things that we've heard for however long we've been alive, you know, for me, I'm 44. Um, I don't know your ages. I'm not going to ask. Um, but <laughs> we did that before you got on. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Just things that you've heard, you know, over the years, you know, conversations you've heard in your house, things that you've heard, you know, passed down from grandparents, aunts and uncles, you know, you know, negative things that you've heard, things that, you know, you've thought of in the back of your mind, you know, is that okay? You know, write that stuff down, put it in a box or, you know, a bucket or somewhere and, you know, be intentional this week about finding, you know, someone that you feel safe with, a friend, um, whomever of a different race and just asking questions about those things and, and, you know, getting the answer and marking it off. Cause like I said before, I guarantee you at the end of the day, we have so many similarities that, you know, we just aren't aware of because we're too afraid to ask the questions. We're too afraid of what our friends might think if they see us, you know, staying in too long, with a person of opposite race. Um, everybody's so worried about being a sellout. Um, you're not going to be a sellout if you stand up and talk for 15 minutes with a person of a different race. I don't care what people say. You're just not. But be intentional about finding out um, some answers to some of those myths that you've heard that's been ingrained in us for years. And, um, you know, cross it off. I promise you it'll do your heart and your soul some good. Yeah. So, yeah, I like that. I like that. Mm, that's a good challenge. <laughs> Great challenge. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and I, pre I appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys. I'll be honest. There's for me, the, the way that I, that I learn the best is through conversations like this, where yes. we can just be open mm -hmm. and honest. And so I look forward to us doing this again. All right. Thank All you, right. Jennifer. Thank you. I truly want to say thank you for um, opening up this topic. Um, I know how uncomfortable it um, has been getting here. So I just want to thank you for hanging in there and, you know, opening up the forum for this. Thank you, guys. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. All right. All right.